Hello and welcome everyone. Before we start, I'd like to let everyone know this evening's webinar will be recorded and posted at the college's website in the future. So good evening, alumni, colleagues, friends, staff, faculty, Sisters of St. Joseph. We're so glad that you could be with us this, this evening. Um, and thank you for being here. Thank you for making the time. We are very proud to bring you this very special presentation on Chestnut Hill College's Center for Concussion Education and Research with its founding executive director and CHC professor, Dr. Bill Ernst. My name is Michelle Presnell. I'm the Associate Director of Development in our Office of Institutional Advancement. And helping me out tonight here is Stephanie Reif, the Associate Director of Advancement Events. Thank you also for being here, Stephanie. I hope that many of you were able to read the article in the most recent issue of the CHC Magazine about the Center for Concussion Education and Research. It was a really wonderful article and uh, gained the attention of, um, as you know, the concussions have gained the attention of the news in the last couple of years and how to keep our young people safe is so important um, while they continue to play the sports that they love. So right first, we're going to watch a presentation by Dr. Ernst and then we'll have time for some questions at the end. We ask that you please save your questions for the end of the presentation. And then my colleague Steph will come on and help explain how to use the Q&A function so that you can ask your questions and we'll read the questions so that everyone can hear. So first, please allow me to introduce our presenter, Dr. Bill Ernst. Dr. William J. Ernst, as he's known, is a faculty member in the Doctor of Psychology program in clinical psychology and the founding executive director of the Center for Concussion Education and Research at Chestnut Hill College. Dr. Ernst completed a postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, Cooper Hospital. His work focuses on the development of interventions designed to increase concussion knowledge and reporting in athletes. He led the team that was awarded from the Mind Matters Educational Programs Challenge. We'll hear more about that in this presentation, sponsored by the National Collegiate Athletic Association and the Department of Defense. And that was to develop a novel peer concussion education program. And like I said, we'll hear from Bill on that. He maintains an independent practice in clinical neuropsychology, focusing on assessment of children and adults with various conditions, including ADHD, learning disabilities, and traumatic brain injury. Welcome, Dr. Ernst, and thank you for being here. Thank you, Michelle, for such a fine introduction. I really appreciate it. And thanks to Michelle, Stephanie, and Aaron Woolley in the Office of Institutional Advancement for being such wonderful collaborators on the article that hopefully you had a chance to take a look at, as well as this presentation. They're wonderful partners and very patient, and Linda Lowe as well, I should add, very patient and listening to me go on and on about this, uh, listening very politely and helpfully. And, and so anyway, um, here we are. So um, what I'm gonna do is um, talk about our Chestnut Hill College's Center for Concussion Education and Research. And the title of our talk is Empowering Students um, to Be the Pioneers of Their Own Well-Being, okay? And, we're gonna do three things. We're gonna talk about the origin of the center and the peer concussion education program. How did all this get started? Where did it come from? And I'll say dessert had a little something to do with how this all got started. And Dr. Lenore Talley knows exactly what I'm talking about. But we will then also talk about, um, again, the peer concussion education program. How did that get started? After we talk about the origin of the center and our flagship program, the Peer Concussion Education Program, I'm gonna take you on a virtual tour of the Center for Concussion Education and Research website, as well as the Peer Concussion Education Program's online manual. And then I'll end with current projects and future plans. And then the last thing is the thing I'm most excited about is being able to talk with um, all the Griffins out there um, and any faculty, staff, or students that might be listening in. That for me will be the, the fun part of this. So let's talk a little bit about the impetus for all of this and, and a little bit of background 
And, and that is the culture of concussion in competitive sport. So what is that culture? Some of you may know this firsthand or may have just you know, thought about it. Um, student athletes typically don't want to report their symptoms. There's a culture of playing through it, which in some respects is an admirable thing. Um, you know, toughen it out, uh, you know, working through it. But unfortunately, when it comes to concussion, that's quite dangerous. They also don't want to let their teammates down. Again, another very admirable quality or attitude to have. It's very important and it works well under most circumstances, just not with concussion. They don't want to lose their spot on a team in playing time. Um, collegiate student athletes represent a very rare group a group that is about four to five percent of high school and, and club athletes. They've worked so hard. They've committed so much. Their families have committed so much that the last thing they want to do is lose their spot or playing time, which is, you know, the big reward for all that hard work. And then game season situational factors to prevent concussion reporting. Playing against the rival, playoff game, championship game. Okay, trying to get into the NCAA, NCAA tournament. These are all situational factors that can prevent reporting. So again, these are all examples of thoughts and attitudes that create barriers to athletes reporting their concussions to healthcare personnel, and that decreases their safety along with their short and long-term well-being. So this is really the impetus that got us started, got us moving along in terms, and, and got the, the sports medicine and the psychology fields, athletic training fields together to say, we gotta, we gotta do something about this, it's a problem. So concussion education's been around now for about 25 years or so. All right, so um, this here is the culture that I was talking about and, and the slide I just discussed, and here's where we, where we are. So current approaches to concussion education, what they all are, what, what every concussion education program is trying to do, and they're all over the place. The NCAA, the Centers for Disease Control, um, lots of different groups um, and, and organizations have developed really fine concussion education programs. And what they're trying to do is increase knowledge about concussion awareness, increase uh, athlete reporting, so early and honest symptom reporting, uh, and compliance with concussion treatment and return to play protocols. Um, there is no way to completely understand what's going on in the brain of someone with a concussion um, definitively. There's no blood test or saliva test or even brain scan. We really need collaboration with student athletes. We need them to tell us that they're not right. Now we might observe something obvious like they have a collision and they fall down and they're dizzy, they can't get up or they're unconscious. We, we can see those things but we don't always see the vast majority of concussions that occur. Um, the, the symptoms don't always get to the point where someone's obviously impaired. So we need their help. Um, and a lot of the concussion education programs, I would consider them top-down models. What I mean by that is you have an expert authority like the NCAA or a sports medicine physician or someone like me, a neuropsychologist, and they, you know, we give a lecture to the students or the NCAA has produced some really nice and helpful materials like fact sheets and videos. These are important. And what they have de been demonstrated to do in the research is increase knowledge of symptoms, awareness, and the risks of premature return to play. But what they have not been found to do, there's very little evidence of this, um, is that they haven't been found to change the culture associated with concussion in competitive sports. And, and so by that, I mean, there's a lot of research pretty consistently finding that in anonymous surveys, about 40 to 50% of collegiate athletes and even high school athletes are admitting that they had a concussion, they, they, they were almost certain it was a concussion or they were certain, and they just chose not to report it for the reasons I mentioned earlier. So the current state of the art um, in terms of concussion education, the good news is we have nice movement in terms of everyone understanding what concussions are, knowing what the symptoms are, and knowing what the risks are of continuing to play with a concussion. Um, however, it's not changing the behavior around reporting, which is what's needed to increase safety of our student athletes. So, 
Thankfully, the NCAA and the Department of Defense joined forces for the Mind Matters Challenge to change the future of concussion. To better serve student athletes on the field and service members on the battlefield, we need to change the culture of concussion safety. And this was a joint venture um, that was about $7 million. And what the My Matters Challenge had two pieces to it. They had a research challenge, which was a multi-year challenge. And the idea there was to do a lot of research on what keeps athletes from reporting and what might change the culture. And then there was an educational programs challenge. Um, and there were six groups that were, were funded in that challenge. The idea was, we need an educational program right away. Go ahead and develop it, and then we'll figure it out from there. So I led a team at Chestnut Hill College um, that included Dr. Lenore Talley, Dr. Meredith Neville, our former athletic director, um, uh, Lynn Tubman. Um, and we led a team, I led a team, uh, and we put in a proposal. And our proposal was to develop a peer concussion education program. If you remember earlier, I was talking about that top-down model. Um, of education that predominates, we decided to go from the bottom up and, and meet the top down approaches in the middle. And the idea was simply to train two student athletes per team under our supervision and guidance to teach their teammates about concussion. And I'll get a little bit more into what we do with the program. So we were awarded um, $75,000 to develop the program. Um, and we won a $25,000 cash prize for our proposal being selected, just the proposal. So I met up with Lynn Ortali and Meredith Neville and Lynn Tubman and I said, you know, we gotta look into this prize. I call the NCAA and I go, can you tell me about the prize? And they're like, it's a prize. Like, <laughs> I go, okay, yeah, but what can you do it? They're like, whatever you want, it's unrestricted. So after a few quick musings of a trip to Hawaii, a new car, myself and Lynn and Meredith, and Lynn decided, why don't we use the money, donate it to the college to seed the concussion center. Turned out to be a great decision, and you'll see why in a little bit. All right, so after our proposal was selected, we were one of six groups from across the country. This was higher ed, for-profit, non-profit, uh, public, private organizations. Um, we were flown out to NCAA headquarters um, in Indianapolis. And on the left here is Brigadier General John Dingle uh, of the Army Medical Command, and then Dr. Ortali, our Vice President for Student Life, and, and one of our, our leaders in the center. Uh, Dr. Neville is in the middle, our Director for Research and Assessment, who has collaborated with me closely every step of the way on pretty much everything we've done. Um, and then that's me with my eyes closed, of course. And then to the right of me is, or left of me actually, um, is Dr. Brian Hainline. He is a senior vice president at the NCAA and their first chief medical officer, and he is a neurologist. So now the fun is over and the hard work begins, but it was still fun. Uh, now we move into the program development phase. So we decided to pilot our program to develop it and implement it with the women's soccer and men's lacrosse teams at Chestnut Hill College. And we decided to make an online manual. And the idea there was we wanted something that was scalable and easy to disseminate. And you'll see that in a little bit. And part of what helped us win the proposal phase uh, was that you know, the NCAA and the DOD wanted something that any athletic department or perhaps military um, service unit could access easily. And so that was the idea there. As I mentioned earlier, we trained two peer concussion educators, two student athletes per team to serve as peer concussion educators. And they do two things. They provide their teammates with a seminar that increases concussion knowledge. It goes a little bit deeper than the typical concussion education program around what is a concussion, what's going on in your brain, what can happen long and short term. Um, and then what was really unique about our program is we have an exercise that is designed to increase concussion reporting. Um, and that exercise consists of a worksheet where the peer concussion educators lead their team in this worksheet where they list thoughts that prevent reporting and they change those thoughts to those that might increase reporting. And here's what the worksheet looks like. On the left side, they put in the thoughts that prevent reporting. On the right side, they replace each thought with one that might increase reporting. What is really important about this is, unlike 
uh, most other educational programs where you could literally just sit there and listen or maybe read something and sign it or act like you're reading. This is forces the student athletes to do something. It engages them directly in their own educational process. The other thing is, and this is the thing I really think is, is, is really interesting and cool about this is they're creating some of their own education material that is unique to who they are as a person and as an athlete, unique to their team and the school that they're at. So, you know, depending on gender, sport, institution, um, there can be different barriers, thoughts that prevent reporting and different replacement thoughts that might increase reporting. So this is a very important aspect of our program and one that is unique. Um, this is borrowed directly from cognitive behavioral therapy. And the basic idea is if you, it, it's, it's your thinking about a situation that has a big part in how you feel, the emotions you have and the behaviors you choose to engage in. So if you target the thinking and you address that, you're likely to have a, a uh, change for the better in your emotional state and the behaviors you choose to engage in. So the other thing that's really unique about our program at Chestnut Hill College is that once these peer concussion educators are trained, they're embedded on the team throughout the year. This isn't come in once and take your, your you know, watch a video or, or read something or listen to someone give a talk. They, we do that. We have a formal, you know, seminars that I just mentioned that we do, but now the peer educators are there. Every practice, every training session, social events, the dorm room, and they're there as role models for concussion safety. They're there as an educational resource, a source of support, a liaison between their teammates, their coaches, and the healthcare personnel. And very much in, tr in the tradition of Chestnut Hill College and the Sisters of St. Joseph, the dear neighbor, okay? Our program is very much aligned with that very important concept and maxim. Let's look after each other. Let's stop hiding this. Let's be honest with one another and take care of one another. So that's kind of part of what's in the DNA, if you will, at Chestnut Hill College, which I think has played a very big role in making this program so um, successful so far. So um, myself and Meredith Neville published an article on how we developed the program um, and a description of the peer concussion education program in the Journal of Athletic Training. And that's one of the leading sports medicine journals. Uh, and also it was really perfect to publish in this journal because the most likely healthcare professional to implement our program is going to be an athletic trainer. And in the article, we have links to the concussion center in our program. So that way folks can easily get to it. So that was really nice that that happened. All right. So we're really, you know, doing well with all this. And um, we developed our program. And then we got an invitation from the NCAA, which we weren't expecting because unlike the research challenge that I mentioned earlier, which was a multi-year process, the educational programs challenge was only supposed to be one year. Develop your educational program, submit it to us, and thank you very much. Well, the DOD and, this, and, and the NCAA were so pleased with how our program came out that they said, you know what, we think it would be a really good idea to see if there is evidence that it does what you all claim it does. It looks like it, it would work well, but we want evidence. We want scientific evidence. We were the only program from the Mind Matters Educational Program Challenge, the six finalists, to receive funding to conduct a multi-site randomized controlled study to determine its effectiveness. We received $207,350 from the NCAA and the DOD. Um, and the study investigators were Meredith Neville, myself, and Dr. Kevin McCarthy. Um, always good to sandwich yourself in between really smart people. It tends to work out pretty well. All right, so 10 colleges or universities representing all NCAA divisions clicked on our online manual and they implemented the program without any intervention from us, just like it would happen the way it was designed. Um, and, and about 1,500 student athletes were in the study um, and about half were in the experimental condition, meaning they received the program. And then you had about half in a control group. So you compare the experimental to the control group to see if the program works. And what happened was um, student athletes on the teams that received the peer concussion education program, the experimental condition, showed significantly greater increases on all 10 outcome measures compared to the student athletes on the teams that did not receive the program. This was a very good outcome. 
This typically doesn't happen that much. Um, and it was a major relief because when you do a randomized controlled trial, you don't know how it's going to go. I mean, it could, the program could have a weird um, um, counterintuitive effect that results in athletes being less likely to report, or maybe they don't report any more than a control group does. But this turned out really great. And we were able to publish the results of that study in the Journal of Athletic Training as well. Um, myself um, and my colleagues, doctors Neville and McCarthy. Um, and again, once again, we we're able to embed links to our center and, and the program. Um, now, since all this has gone well, we get invited to the NCAA DOD Concussion Education Summit. And you can see the groups that we're with. These are some of the major research institutions in the United States, you know, UNC Chapel Hill, University of Wisconsin, Madison, and the United States Air Force Academy, and then Chestnut Hill College is in with this group. Um, so um, this is the group that's taking the lead in shaping where concussion education is going. And I have to say, I'm very proud to be part of a college that came together in a very effective way to allow us to compete and succeed with universities that have far more resources and track records in the in research intensive grant arena. So it really is a testimony to your college and our college. So now sometimes, you know, I wonder about the, the Sisters of St. Joseph and the connections that they have. Um, just three days ago, this was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which is arguably um, one of the top two or three and could be the top sports medicine journal in the world. Um, improving concussion education, consensus from the NCAA Department of Defense, My Matters Research and Education Grand Challenge. I was a panelist um, along with Dr. Neville with all the other um, scientists from the institutions that you just saw. And I'm just going to read you an excerpt from that article. Um, I'll have my cursor go along. I hope you can see it. Um, eight proposals were funded under the research challenge whose projects ran from 2016 to 2019. Six proposals were funded under the initial education challenge, which ran from 2015 to 2016, with one group, Chestnut Hill College, receiving continued funding from 2017 to 2019. So I was so pleased that they mentioned the college. They didn't have to do that. They could have just said one group, but I don't know. Maybe it's some more of that, that uh, Sisters of St. Joseph intervention happening. You never know. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna transition and I'm gonna take you on a virtual tour of the center. All right, so I know I need to kind of move through this and we're, we're in pretty good time. One way to look at the center for, um, I may need to go five minutes over if that's okay. Um, one way to look at the Center for Concussion Education and Research, um, that, that website is, is the, the, the home for our flagship program, the Peer Concussion Education Program. So this is now publicly available to any um, uh, college in the country or anyone who's interested. And so when you click on the website, um, you see, you know, what our mission is and what we're about. Um, the articles I showed you earlier on our program and the randomized controlled trial were featured. Um, usually they only feature one or two articles per, per published volume of a journal, and they featured ours on all of the social media platforms. So that was kind of fun to do. Um, so, you know, a little bit just about what we're about. Um, and then I'm going to skip over to research. So here, um, you know, we are a educational research center. So we talk about the research we do. And here are, uh, here's a bibliography of our peer reviewed articles and conference presentations in the past year. Um, Meredith Neville and myself and Kevin McCarthy really went into overdrive and and uh, got out there all over the country. Um, and just move this over here. Um, and if you click on this link here, just so you're not looking at a boring bibliography, uh, here are all the different icons of the conferences we presented at. So we presented at about 10 to 12 peer reviewed conferences, national conferences, and another at five or six invited presentations. And so, the appeal of this work and this program that was developed here at the college crosses a lot of disciplines like mind, clinical neuropsychology, um, up here, sports neurology, public health, the American Psychological Association, 
um, the Society for Injury Prevention. Um, and we also um, presented, um, obviously, at Mind Matters, uh, the Philadelphia Union uh, from Major League Soccer, their Youth Academy, and then the National Athletic Trainers Association. Um, so we were all over the place. And just to give you a quick peek geographically, a lot of frequent flyer miles, lots of bouncing around from place to place. Um, we still have not gotten into this section of the country in the middle, so hopefully that'll happen. Um, but anyway, anything, everything's so virtual now, it doesn't matter as much as it used to that sort of thing. All right, so what I'm going to do now is um, show you a couple of other quick things. If you come to the, you know, someone just wants information, we have different resources from the NCAA, American Academy of Neurology, et cetera, uh, CDC, um, lectures that we're planning, press releases, all of that. Um, and now what I'm going to do is bring you to the Peer Concussion Education Program, which really kind of got all this started. All right, so now let's say you read those articles, you're an athletic trainer at a school and you go, hey, I think that looks good, I'd like to try that. Um, what you can do is click on our online manual. And remember, when we developed this program, we did it in person with the men's um, lacrosse and women's soccer team. Um, and we developed these materials, but we also developed this online manual. So this could be easily disseminated and available to any sports medicine physician, athletic trainer um, that wanted to implement this. Um, so here's our manual, and those are our real Chestnut Hill College football players, just in case you were wondering. Um, and we have an overview. Um, we have uh, uh, the program model and rationale. You can just click on and see, like, why, how did they develop this thing? How, how, you know, what were the ideas behind it? And, you know, just real quick, um, you see the old Venn diagram here. It's interdisciplinary. It's peer-mediated and cognitive behavioral. All right. And so there's information on that. And we have our former athletic director, Lynn Tubman, and one of our pioneer peer concussion educators, Andrew Hildebrand, doing brief video kind of statements to, to kind of elaborate on, on what, we, what we did. Um, and then we have a five-step approach for implementing the program. So a question I get a lot from colleagues is, um, and sports medicine folks is, well, how do you select these peer concussion educators? And I say, well, just go to the online manual and click on step two. And then what we have is a narrative on what you should think about when you select these exceptional young men and, and women. Um, and then, hey, you know, you can read it, but you can also hear what the director of athletics what a head coach and what an athletic trainer, what their thought processes were. So we have this nice multimedia approach. All right, now you select the peer concussion educators. Well, what do you have to do next? You have to train them to be peer concussion educators. How do you do that? Well, here's how you do it. Um, here's all the information you need to train them in education module one. Here's the PowerPoint here that you just download. It's all on the website. Um, you want to listen to the athletic trainer that helped me and Dr. Neville train them? Well, here he is, Brendan Connell. Hear what, you know, he has to say. Okay, and then module two, enhancing concussion reporting. All the materials you need to do that, the worksheets, the PowerPoint, they're all right there. Once you train them, the peer educators got to meet with their teams to, to provide their presentations. How do you do that? Well, I don't want to belabor this, but just real quick, we have everything here that you need for them, the peer educators, to give the presentations to their teams. And this is uh, Matt Pedrick, one of our pioneer uh, uh, peer concussion educators. And he's a, a goalie, for, was a goalie for the men's lacrosse team. One of our current peer educators is a goalie. And my son is a goalie in lacrosse. So, and he's a defender in soccer. So my son decided to pick the two positions that have the most collision just to, you know, make his father as anxious as possible. Um, and this is Brie Farrell, woman soccer player. She's an alumni, fellow um, alumni like all of you, uh, most of you on the call here. Um, and she talks about her experience as a peer educator. So last but not least, um, you want, let's say you want to do some research on the program at, at your university. Even though we have a randomized controlled trial, we have all the information that you would need to use the same measures and process in our, our research at your institution. Um, so I hope you're able to see this all okay. 
I know, um, you know, just about out of time, uh, and this is a minor miracle for me. If I say 30 minutes, anyone that knows me knows that it's going to be 45 minutes at least. So I'm almost there, um, and I, I'm really excited about your questions. Um, so um, again, that $25,000 cash prize um, from from the proposal phase, we used that, we donated that to Seed Center. Um, and in terms of what's next, well, we have a lot of research that's ongoing. Um, we have four manuscripts that are under peer review, um, and we have four more in preparation. Um, we're continuing to implement the program at Chestnut Hill College. We're in our fifth year doing it. Um, this year, 10 teams are gonna receive the program. We will train 20 peer concussion educators. We'll have about 300 student athletes go through that program. Um, current partnerships, NYU's Concussion Center and SUNY Albany Science and High School program. We have research partnerships with those folks. Um, future plans, we're gonna develop a high school version of the program, hopefully, and a military version of the program. Here are the references that were cited throughout the presentation. And I wanna take a minute or two to acknowledge a lot of folks, and this is very important to me. Um, I didn't do this by myself. I, I, I you know, led a lot of it, but I couldn't have done it without everybody on these acknowledgements. So the center leadership, Meredith Neville and Lynn Ortali. Um, I'm glad I bumped into Lynn in the dessert line five years ago and said, I have an idea, Lynn, do you have a few minutes? And one of the things that's great about Chestnut Hill College, unlike a lot of other places, everyone is so welcoming and wants to have the conversation. Other places, you know, it's hard to get meetings with high level administrators like Dr. Ortal. You know, they're busy. And even if you have grant money, they don't always want to meet with you. Um, so at Chestnut Hill, it's special. We, we, we're, we're, we collaborate and we're, we're, we're lean and efficient. Um, faculty researchers, my colleagues, Drs. Neville and McCarthy, outstanding researchers and scientists. Um, the doctoral student researchers, all of which were funded through Mind Matters, they all received stipends in varying degrees, and many of these students now are going on to postdoctoral fellowships in neuropsychology. They did their dissertation, some of them in this area, or pilot studies of our program. Um, the Department of Athletics, you couldn't find a finer group of folks in that department, led by Jesse Balser. And I have to say, none of this works if you don't have leadership and buy-in from the top in athletics, because you're not changing a culture around safety if you don't have a class act like Jesse Balser, who really walks the walk. He doesn't just talk the talk. And I have to say, as a father, my son ever was good enough to play in college, that department, I'd be okay with that, because I know the quality in terms of the leadership and the coaches like Sandy Dixon, Dixon and Brian Dockery, who stepped up and helped us, athletic trainers like Denise Wisniewski, Coach Mike Terranova, and Jessica Day, and there's many more um, wonderful people. I want to quickly acknowledge the administration uh, uh, at Chestnut Hill College and the Department of Professional Psychology. Um, these um, professionals often don't get recognition for this, yet we can't do it without their oversight, guidance, all the work that get, has to get done. Sister Carol, uh, Dr. Dockery, uh, our, our VPAA, Dean Cunningham, Dr. Rothery, chairperson of my department, Dave Woodford, Mitch Bilker, you know, making sure all the financial stuff is appropriate and works well. We can't do it without those folks. And equally important, our center website and online manual technical team, Kristen, Don, Chelsea, Marilee, and Stephanie. I can't do that. You know, I, I can't develop a website. It would be horrible if I tried to do it. And that website you saw, it works very nicely, um, very smoothly. And this was the group that helped us with that. And obviously the Office of Institutional Advancement staff for helping us do this. And the last but not least, um, our NCAA consultants, Dr. Emily Crocious, who is one of the top concussion researchers in the world, and Dawn Booth. Without them, um, they helped guide us through the process. So um, a lot of folks came together and, and helped us be successful here at the college, and I'm proud to be a part of it. So um, it's time for questions now, and I'm only five minutes over, so that's uh, pretty good for me. So, um, Bill, you, you yeah. did a wonderful job. What a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, I learned a lot. I hope uh, everyone else here attending learned a lot as well. And I think Stephanie is going to have some questions, but I'm going to start it off because I have a question. Um, sure. Have you heard from other schools who are using your resources online to start programs of their own? So um, 10 schools um, started the program um, through, you know, as part of the randomized control trial. Mm -hmm. 
we know the athletic trainer up at NY, up at the concussion center at NYU, she wants to implement it there. Um, some of the folks that we've spoke with um, through, you know, different research collaborations have expressed interest. I haven't reached out to anyone. It's kind of hard to track who's actually doing it. Um, but I was recently on a call with um, a, a call, an athletic trainer who's a faculty member at Duquesne, and she works a lot with different athletic trainers. And, and um, she mentioned that um, there's a lot of individuals. She thinks, you know, uh, about half of, of departments across the country might actually use this. I mean, I have no way to know for sure, or prove that, but it, it, it's really resonated. And, um, you know, when the articles got featured in the Journal of Athletic Training, that was a big thing for us. Um, so exact number, I don't know, but there's been a lot of interest that, that has been communicated. Okay, uh, Stephanie, any questions? All right, everyone, if you have a question down at the bottom of your sc screen, there's a little button that says Q&A. Just click that button, you can submit your question. We're waiting for some questions to come in. I will ask another question. How is it, um, how are the students receiving the program? Um, so we've, we've actually, in some of the publications, um, and I recently did a um, presentation um, at the National Athletic Trainers Association, it was, it was virtual. Um, so the student athletes that um, are the peer concussion educators, um, during the, the pilot studies and the 10 universities across the country, um, the randomized controlled trial, overall, the peer concussion educators reported they, they really liked um, the opportunity to educate their peers. They felt the online manual and having an athletic trainer supporting them really helped. Some of them did find at times it was challenging, uh, depending on the nature of their team, because on one hand, the strength is their peers. And so they're going to get their teammates' attention and trust often. On the other hand, their peers, it's not like a coach coming in or, a, or someone like me. So sometimes they have a little trouble, depending on their personality, fully engaging everybody. Um, but um, the peer educators overall like it. And I, I know, and Jesse Bowser and I have talked about this, um, some of them are really like, you know, um, happy and, and, and really flattered that they were asked. It, it's an honor and, and it's a very serious job uh, that we're in a very important thing we're asking them to do. In terms of student athletes that receive the program, we still need to do some research kind of debriefing them. But in our randomized controlled trial, we did see that it significantly increased concussion knowledge and not only intention to report yourself, but intention to report a teammate and positive attitudes that support concussion reporting. Those were those 10 outcomes. Um, so it seems like it's working pretty well in terms of the, the experience of student athletes that receive it. Um, and it's a uh, team by team. Like um, some teams kind of really get engaged and have really good conversations and others, you know, they, they, they're not quite there yet, but. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. All right, it looks like we have several questions. Um, one question we have is how is this being promoted to other colleges? So this is currently available, as I mentioned, in every article we publish typically, like the two big ones that I showed you. Um, there are links to the online manual and there are links to the concussion center website. So one of the great things when we got accepted for publication at the journal of athletic training is, you know, every, there's about 40,000 members of the national athletic trainers association. And that's just members of that association. There's now you could, anyone would like to go in and look in the May volume of it can see the articles can read them and click on the link. So, research and publication and those 15 or so national conference presentations I mentioned, that's another way. That's how our connection with NYU started. I was in Indianapolis at the sports neurology conference and it was a couple of folks came up to me and said, this looks like a really cool thing to do. And then we kind of exchanged information and now we're planning some things with them. We'll see how it goes. Um, other ways uh, of promoting it um, are, you know, social media, um, things like this that, you know, Office of Institutional Affairs did are really helpful. Um, but the main thing is, um, is, you know, keep publishing this, this 
kind of research. Uh, it's very, very important. And also the NCAA, when I mentioned part of what, I was just on a call with them a few months ago, and now they're moving into all the eight groups, like us, the Air Force Academy, UNC Chapel Hill, we are all done with our programs pretty much, and we still are publishing things, but the main publications are out. So now we're kind of collaborating with the NCAA and how we can, how they, how we can, you know, work with them to help them promote this. And, you know, I'm really encouraging them to just put all these fine programs on their Sports Science Institute website, you know, make them available that way as well. Great. Then we have another question, which I find very interesting. How would you, or how would an understanding of student athlete behavior translate into helping members of the military address similar concussion issues? Right. So that's a great question. And, and again, the NCAA and DOD, it's a joint um, challenge because student athletes at the collegiate level, very competitive. A lot of the, the, the same barriers don't want to let your team down, play through it, be tough. That's also happening on military units. So they're often similar in age and they're often, you know, elite. Uh, and, and so we designed this thinking ahead and, and because it was NCAA DOD, we designed this in a way and there's a section on the online manual called modification to other groups. Um, so we designed this in a way where it could be pretty easily adapted to the military, which we're hoping to do. Um, but the research on barriers to reporting and interventions to increase reporting, you could pretty easily, um, you know, you still have to do the research directly with military service personnel because you don't want to assume too much. But it's the same idea. Like, I don't want to let down my team. I don't want to let down my unit. You know, I don't want to be a wimp. I want to suck it up and, and fight through it. I want to literally fight through it. So it, it, there's a lot of overlap. All right, another question is, can you talk a little bit about the experience that the peer educators had, uh, have had during, during and since the, uh, their participation? So how it went during the, uh, their time with the program and then what they've learned since? So, you know, again, most of them are, are grateful for the opportunity they learn more about concussion. They learn about cognitive behavioral therapy, which, you know, if you want to change attitudes, you know, um, that's a good thing to know. Um, here, the thing that really, um, I didn't really fully consider, and it was pointed out to me by the commissioner of the athletic um, conference that Chestnut Hill um, plays in. And then Jesse Bowser and Lynn Ortali and I have talked about this and, and Meredith too, is this really gives them a great opportunity to learn leadership skills, okay? So the peer educators, they learn about concussion, they learn how to be a leader, okay? And they learn how to be an agent for, of change in a positive way. So these kinds of things, I think, are, you know, things they take away from this. And, you know, these folks, you know, very few are gonna make a living playing the sport that they, they play. They're all incredible athletes, but, you know, you know make it to the professional rank so almost impossible. Um, so they go and they interview for internships or jobs. They, they can have this on their resume and, and they can show another thing that they were tasked with and selected. That's great. And somebody asked, is this position paid for the students or is it a volunteer position within the team? It's a volunteer position. I wish we could pay them, you know, but um, I would imagine the NCAA would really get upset. Um, and we'd get in a lot of trouble, and then Jesse would have to pull me into his office, and I'd be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so, so, but I will say this, throughout the whole research process, we always fed them, and the key to getting them on time was pizza, and then when the pizza wore itself out, we upped it to Chipotle, and it was funny, oh. when I, <laughs> Tally and I were reviewing the budget, and it was like, this pizza bill is like ridiculous, and I'm like, well, We'll see if Dave Woodford flags it or the NCAA and so far so good. <laughs> but we had a ridiculously high pizza bill, um, which we did put into the grant budget, seriously, but it, it was a gross underestimate. So if we ever do this again, we'll be tripling. But we can't pay them, so it's all volunteer. All right, so this is obviously a great accomplishment for the college. Is a national randomized control trial something that you often see at a small liberal arts college? 
Um, not particularly because you need a lot of money to do that. And small liberal arts college don't typically get grants for that type of research. They might get grants for developing and Chestnut Hill College has been very successful in getting some outstanding grants to do things like uh, developing an education program, you know, or curricular types of things. Um, but this uh, arena, um, usually the grants go to the, the what, we, what we call R1 or research intensive school. But if you find the right grant um, and the right granting agency or organization you, you, and you come up with a good idea, um, you know, and you have really strong institutional support, which we had here and still have, um, then um, you can be competitive like we have been. But it's not that common. It, it can happen. And that's not a criticism of small liberal arts college. They're really great at what they're designed to do. Um, but this is something that doesn't typically happen. And, you know, about the peer concussion educators getting paid, it's one point I do want to make. All those doctoral students, they all got stipends and, and that was a great thing because uh, graduate study is not cheap. And so the fact that they were able to learn how to you know, do cutting edge research, present it at conferences with myself and Dr. Neville and Dr. McCarthy, and then they got a nice research stipend. That was a really great thing. Because graduate students, you know, they're, they're always typically the vast majority of them, you know, they're really, you know, on a tight budget. Excellent. All right, and we have a question. Is the subject of treatment included at all in this program, or is it more diagnosis, how to help once you've had a concussion? Good question. Yes. Um, so um, one of the things that we have in our program and we spend a lot of time on is to return the play protocol, which essentially is, you know, touches on treatment. Um, and things that you can do, we also touch on um, in the program and the peers talk about it, how you can decrease the likelihood of getting a concussion. And then things you can do to take care of yourself while you have a concussion. So we do address those things. Um, but going over the return to play protocol is very important. So in case you're not familiar with that, most people probably are at this point, but if an athlete has a concussion, there's a protocol they have to go through, a stepwise protocol that the athletic trainers and the sports medicine physicians supervise. And a lot, what we found with our research is a lot of them didn't even know why they had to do it, what it was about, why, you know, how it worked. So we have the student athletes, the peer educators, walk them through that. And the athletic trainer or myself are there to you know, help explain anything if they, if they have any additional questions that the peer educators aren't sure of. What we found in our research was that really had a positive effect because once the student athletes on the teams go, oh, that's why we have to do this. That's why we go through these steps. That's how it works. Um, that's an important thing. If you think about any operation or, or treatment that any of us might take, you know, it's nice when our doctor sits us down and goes, here's why you, I want you to do this. <laughs> you know, here's why I'm giving, this, you're giving you this medicine or having you do this physical therapy. We're much more likely to comply with it if we understand the rationale. So that's um, very important. And the cool thing about the sessions are usually there's – it could be a peer educator. It could be someone else that has had a concussion and has gone through the protocol. And they'll usually speak up and go, hey, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah, it takes a little time and you might be out for a week or two. But, you know, there is a procedure, an evidence-based procedure. Uh, the athletic trainers and, and people like me, and we're not just, you know, sitting there finding ways not to let them get back to the sport they love to play. We want them to get back as soon as they can when they're safe. So they'll, they'll say something like, you know, this is, this is how they kind of, objectively determine when we are safe. So it's not just like guesswork. Um, so that's a really important feature of the program. Great. Um, we have one more. And are we using this as a recruiting tool at all? And if so, how has it been received? Is it good for student athletes coming into Chestnut Hill to know that this program exists and so, is so being beneficial? Yeah, that is a good question. And, and the answer to that is um, we've been talking about how to best do that. And myself and, and, and Jesse and, and, and Lynn, um, you know, we've been talking about that. And um, one of the things that's um, an advantage is this program wasn't designed to replace the existing concussion education. It was designed to, to work with it and enhance it. So if you're a student athlete, and this is where I think, and, and I, that's a, such a good question, in terms of recruitment, 
Um, and, you know, of course, I'll leave that to the enrollment experts here and, and, and the athletics folks. That's a little bit out of my lane. Um, but what I would say is it, it might be helpful to make sure it's make sure that prospective athletes and their families are aware that we're on the leading edge of concussion education. Okay, we're on the leading edge of that. And we have a program here that we do with the high, you know, the contact and collision sports like football and soccer, and lacrosse, et cetera, basketball. Um, we have this additional program that is evidence-based that was supported with funding from the NCAA and the DOD. And we do that on top of the required education, which increases the likelihood. And again, we now have, we always used to say maybe it will, but now we have the evidence that it does. It increases the likelihood that your um, student athlete will be safe. And would you rather have your kid on a team where the coach and the teammates intimidate them, discourage them, ridicule them when they have the courage to say, I don't feel right. I have bad headaches now because I got hit really hard in the game. I'm nauseous and I'm confused. I need some help. Would you rather have your kid in, in a program that, that doesn't support their, their health and well-being, or would you rather have them in a program with an athletics department like we have at Chestnut Hill, where we have this additional program that goes right after that and, 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 and attacks that mentality and tries to change it to one where the peer educators and the team are now moving toward, hey, it's okay. We want you to report it. And quite frankly, what we talk about with the peer educators and what they learn is the quicker you report it, the quicker you're gonna get back on the field when you're safe and 100%. And if you don't report it, and the student athletes, they know this and they come up with this themselves. If you don't report it, you're not playing 100%. Your coach doesn't know why. You might get yanked out anyway and lose your time or your spot, you know? So report it, get out, and you're not helping your team either. You know, they, uh, one of the biggest barriers is I don't wanna let the team down. And what we do in the program is we talk about by playing concussed and not 100%, you are letting your team down because you're not 100%. You're not solid. So let's get out. Let's be safe. Let's remember you're, you have a life to live and, and, and an education to, to obtain. Let's make sure that's kept. And that's what's great about our, our school and, and Jesse and athletics. They really look at things holistically as student athletes and, and, and Lynn or Tally and student life. And so it makes my job so easy. Um, but, but that would be, you know, I know this is kind of a long winded response, but that would be my, my response that, you know, this, this could be helpful in terms of recruiting and, and I'm not saying the program's perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not saying all the student athletes are all holding hands, you know, and, you know, we don't have, you know, some athletes that aren't getting the message or situations. It's a very entrenched culture that we're, we're working on changing, but I will say from anecdotal evidence when I talk with the coaches and the athletic trainers here, as well as the scientific evidence from our research, this program does seem to make a nice dent in that culture and change it one. And the last thing I'll say, I just trained a cadre of peer concussion educators um, last night, and I asked some of the returning veterans to share experiences. And, and this one young man um, who I believe is on men's lacrosse, he said, you know, um, it's no big deal, he said to the other peer educators. I just went over to one of my teammates and I said, hey, you got hit hard. You don't look right. Let's go tell coach. Let's get the tr athletic trainer in. Let's get you looked at. That's a new thing. That didn't happen before this program. And the beauty of it is it's not me on the sidelines or, or a coach. It's the team itself. And, and that's where we believe the change really needs to happen. So thanks for listening to that answer. As you can tell, I'm a professor. So, you know, this is kind of what happens when I get asked questions. Do you think we have time for one more? I think we could do one more if you've got the time, Bill. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I, hey, there's a lot of, you know, alums here, Griffins. I have all the time that they want, kind of, but I do. I have plenty. Of time. Great. So I think this is a nice question to end on. How did the college's mission play a role in the program coming together? So, you know, it's funny. Uh, when, when I wrote up the proposal, you know, I, I one of the things that you needed to answer in the proposal was what kind of support do you have at the institution and and ha why is your institution one that kind of has the environment that would make a pro program that would help change the culture successful and all i had to do was just write about you know the the holistic 
approach to students here at Chestnut Hill, the Dear Neighbor, the mission of the Sisters of St. Joseph, okay? It, it just, that's all I had to do is just literally quote that. And, and that I think really helped us. And what also really helped us was, this was a partnership that spanned academic affairs, student life, and athletics, okay? So the whole school came together, faculty, staff, sports medicine folks, and most importantly, the coaches and the student athletes. So, so you know, it was easy for me to say, and, and, and what usually is a limitation for getting these types of grants is you're not a big brand name school. Well, I was able with my team to say, well, yeah, we're not like University of Wisconsin, Madison, but we are lean and there aren't really, there aren't big silos at our school. I can literally knock on Jesse's door or Lynn's door or a colleague or a coach, Mike Terranova, you know, I can just go, hey, Mike, you got a minute? Other places, you know, you can't do that. It's very hard. So that's an advantage. So that's kind of what we use to kind of say, hey, we're the right place for this. And the NCAA agreed and it's all come together nicely. Well, thank you so much, Bill, for your time tonight. That was so informative. I, I just, I, I can't thank you enough. It was really wonderful to hear from you about this, uh, like you said, cutting edge program at Chestnut Hill College. I think, um, I feel very proud to work there and I think a lot of people are feeling the same way right now. So thank you again for your time. My pleasure. I only wish we could have done this in person. It would have been so nice to meet folks that attended um, and, and to be with you all, but um, uh, hopefully that will be soon. But um, thank you so much, Michelle and Stephanie and, and everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules and uh, listening to me talk about all this stuff. You, you all saved my wife an hour of hearing more about it. And she's at this point, she's heard enough about the stuff that I'm doing. So, so thank you so much for your kind attention. And, uh, you know, if anyone has more questions, you just go on the center website, click on my link, my email's there. Feel free to send me an email and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Bye everybody. Take care now.